on camera. Today's November 10th, 2016. We're at the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, my name is Joe Bruckner. I'm a volunteer at the History Center. And with me is Tony Hilliard, who's also a volunteer, and Sue Verhoff, who's the Director of Oral History and Genealogy at the History Center. Uh, we're here today to conduct an interview in connection with the Library of Congress Veterans History Project. And we're very honored to have with us Mr. Joe Galloway. Uh, Mr. Galloway is a journalist who is the only individual that's been awarded a combat medal by the Army. And also, he's written a book, a bestseller, uh, We Were Soldiers Once and Young. And this has been named one of the ten greatest books ever written on war. So it's a real privilege to be with you today and to have you come in and tell us your story. Pleasure to be here. Could you give us your full name and where and when you were born? Joseph Lee Galloway, Jr., uh, born November 13th, 1941, in Bryan, Texas. Okay. And what city and state do you currently live in? I live in Concord, North Carolina. Okay. Tell us a little bit about your upbringing. Oh, my. <laughs> uh, I was born three weeks before Pearl Harbor. <clears throat> and uh, I did not meet my father until the end of 1945 when he came home from service. Mm -hmm. He and five of his brothers wore the uniform in World War II and four of my mother's brothers. Mm -hmm. So we were heavily invested in that war. And my earliest memories are of living in houses full of frightened women looking out the window for the telegraph boy. Uh, you know, they were, all of these uncles and aunts were uh, young couples. They had maybe one or two kids. The war broke out and then the father is gone and he's gone mostly for the duration of the war. So, we, my mother and I lived between her mother's house in the little town of Marquet, Texas, and his mother's house in the little town of Franklin, Texas, which was 28 miles away. <clears throat> and we would ride the bus between those two. We, my mother was pretty good at figuring out when we had worn out our welcome in one place and we moved to the other. <laughs> had a little, I can remember, a little alligator embossed cardboard suitcase we would pack all our belongings in and head down the road. Uh, those were the years of World War II and I, I have a memory of uh, scrap metal collections and saving bacon grease, which I have no idea what they did, something to do with ammunition. Uh, there were, I, you know, I remember my mother, they only gave you, the ration book only had one coupon for a pair of shoes per person per year. And I'm a growing boy. You go through shoes pretty quick. So my mother gave up her shoe ration so that I could have two pair a year. Wow. And uh, that uh, my father was earning $21 a month in the Army, and he gave us a, uh, an allotment so that we got $18 of his 21. He lived off of uh, $4 a month. That bought his cigarettes, I guess. Uh, and uh, it, was, uh, it was interesting times. Do you remember specifically when your dad came back from the war? Oh, I remember it like it was yesterday. He came back and uh, uh, he came up on the porch and he had the little overseas cap he was wearing and I wanted that cap and I was begging for it. 
and he took that cap off his head and he threw it out in the yard and I ran to get it. And when I got back, mom and dad were in the house and the door was locked. <laughs> So they got busy making my little brother. <laughs> but it was uh, interesting times, interesting times. My dad uh, worked at a couple of jobs, took a course at A&M, <clears throat> and uh, took a job with the Humble Oil Company in South Texas in a little town called Refurio. And, uh, my mom and I loaded what furniture we had by then and on the back of a pickup truck and uh, drove down in the winter to join my dad. He had found a place he could rent. It was in the oil boom town and places to live were very hard to come by. So he was down there living in a, in a rooming house for a good while until he could find a, an apartment to rent. And we joined him, and I went through uh, 11 years of public school in that little town and graduated from a high school there in class of 1959. Before we move ahead, I, I want to ask you a question about your father and your uncles. Uh, did your father and or your uncles talk about their experiences in World War II? Not much, not much. Now, my dad did not go overseas. He was scheduled to go with the division, to the Army Division to the Pacific Theater. <clears throat> and they were almost literally lining up to get on the boat when they, they came through asking if anyone could type. And he could type and they pulled him out of the, out of the line and he spent the war in, at Fort Ord, California. And uh, he, he finished up as a tech sergeant. Uh, the other uncles, uh, they were all over the place. One was Army Air Force. Uh, and he flew in the Pacific, New Guinea, and all those places. Uh, my mother had one brother who was uh, in the uh, 101st Airborne and was wounded pretty badly uh, in Europe in the Normandy campaign. Uh, and the rest of them, I think, were just, uh, one was in the Navy, the youngest brother of my dad managed to get in the war like in 44 and uh, was on a Navy ship that was uh, hit by kamikaze pilots off of Okinawa. He survived uh, that. Uh, most of them made it home one shape or another, but, but they got home from it okay. And boy, were they in a hurry to get on with life and living. Mm -hmm but they didn't talk about it much. Didn't talk about it hardly at all until I came home on leave from Vietnam. And I remember my uncle Jiggs, uh, who had been a pilot in the Pacific, and uh, he never would talk about it. In fact, he was kind of really nervous around crowds and he considered a family reunion a crowd. I mean, he would, uh, disappear out the back door into the woods and, uh, and stand around smoking and walking. Mm. And uh, I came back from Vietnam. I didn't like crowds much myself mm. and I walked out there in those woods and for the first time ever, Uncle Jig started telling me about his service and what he saw mm. in the New Guinea campaign and yeah. things like that. Huh. But <clears throat> they didn't think it was worth talking to yeah. you if you didn't understand what they had gone through. Yeah. Mm. And I understand stood that a whole lot more when I had gone through it myself. I'm sure you did. So what did you do after you got out of high school? I went to college for six weeks. 
And those six weeks uh, stood me in good stead. I, I was the campus stringer for the local daily newspaper in Victoria, Texas, the Victoria Daily Advocate. And uh, it, to me, it, it was a junior college, and to me it just seemed like an extension of high school, and I'd had that right up to here. So I, I was, I just turned 17. And I, I was begging my mother to sign the papers so I could enlist in the Army. I wanted out of South Texas, I wanted out of Texas, and I wanted out of school. And uh, I finally browbeat the poor woman to the point where she said, okay, I'll sign. And she and I were in the car on the way to the recruiting office and we Two blocks away, you pass the newspaper office, and my mother, one last gasp attempt, said, Joe, what about your journalism? I said, good call, Mom, stop the car. And I got out, and I went in, and I, I saw, I knew the managing editor, a fine man named Jim Reck. And I said, Mr. Reck, you wouldn't happen to have a vacancy for a reporter. And he said, well, as a matter of fact, I do. And he hired me on the spot, 35 bucks a week and a free subscription to the newspaper. And that saved me from the Army. I'd have probably been in Vietnam carrying a rifle and stripes on my shoulder, I guess. Now, you've got an experience, I believe, when you were much younger where you got into journalism. Oh, too. absolutely. I, I, you know, it's not like I just woke up one morning, 17, and wanted to be a reporter. Uh, when I was nine years old, I traded my old bicycle to an uncle for a, a 1912 Remington typewriter. This is one of those square things about yay high and yay wide and weighed about 50 pounds. And uh, I got my dad to bring me a box of carbon paper. And if I hit those keys as hard as I could, I could make six copies of my home reported, homegrown newspaper for my neighborhood. By then, we lived in an oil camp with about 30 houses. Uh, all the men worked for Humble Oil and Refining Company, which was a family-owned company in those days. It's now called Exxon. It was bought by Standard Oil of New Jersey. And uh, my dad and several of his brothers all worked for that company. <clears throat> and we lived 10 miles outside of Refurio, Texas, on the middle of a big ranch in the middle of one of the biggest oil fields in Texas. And uh, I was the local reporter and publisher of, a, of a, about a weekly newspaper, if I could manage it. Hmm. And uh, I, uh, I made a successful business of it. Back then, it was a real popular Christmas gift for kids was a little printing press that, that you, you set rubber type on this thing and you could run these. Boy, you could run them off a lot quicker than I could type them. And some kid would always get one of those for Christmas. And he'd make a newspaper and then he'd get tired of it. I would sell him my newspaper subscription list. I'd already collected the money, and he would have to fulfill the subscription and not have any money, no operating cash. And he would get bored and he would quit after a week or two, and then I would start it up again. <laughs> so you weren't just a journalist, you were a businessman too. Dang right. <laughs> <laughs> and it worked, <laughs> yeah, obviously. <laughs> but I, I, you know, it was a, a lifelong interest. I worked on the school newspaper, first running the mimeograph machine. You remember yeah, those? Yeah, yeah. I can still smell it. Yeah. Uh, and then a, as a reporter and writer, and uh, I had a, I had very good, almost great English teachers and journalism teachers. 
really encouraged me to that. And uh, at the end of a long life, I have to say I wouldn't change a thing. Um, sure you wouldn't. <laughs> a lot of us are glad you did what you did. <laughs> so after your mom saved settled, me from the army. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about what happened after that. I went to work on the daily newspaper. I worked, uh, they, they generously called it five and a half days a week. What it was was six days a week. I think I had Tuesday and half a day Sunday off. Uh, and uh, I worked on the copy desk, uh, editing stories, writing headlines. And uh, once in a while they would let me go out and report a story. I can remember the first one they sent me on, I really screwed up. It was a historic meeting between two warring women's garden clubs. And they were going to come together and peacefully agree to work on planting oleander plants down the middle of a highway. And I went out and covered this and uh, mixed up the names of the presidents and I, I wrote that story and handed it in and I had shot a picture for they taught me how to use the old speed graphic camera like that and I, I walked in the next day and I could always tell when Jim Reck was mad because his neck got red and he was sitting there and he had about five cigarettes burning at once <laughs> in his ashtray. And uh, he didn't even look at me, he just muttered. And he muttered, you really screwed that one up, Galloway. <laughs> I've had every member of both women's garden clubs on the phone to me explaining to me who their president is and is not. <laughs> Yeah, I thought my career was <laughs> over before it began. <laughs> uh, but I survived and moved on. Uh, it was a very good place to learn. Uh, I, I had either side, I was flanked by older guys who had been in the business a long time. One was a, was a fellow who had made it all the way to the New York Times and then drank his way all the way back down to a small daily in South Texas uh, and then dried out, and, but was still a very flamboyant writer and reporter. And on the other side was a very solid, excellent reporter, thoughtful man who had been the managing editor of an even smaller paper that earned a Pulitzer Prize uh, with the great Box 13 scandal in South Texas when Lyndon Johnson stole, stole his way to Congress into the U.S. Yeah. Senate. There was a mysterious Box 13 in Alice, Texas that uh, somehow caught fire in the basement of the courthouse as the Texas Rangers were on their way to check it out and see if it really did vote 133 to 2 in favor of Lyndon Johnson and it was going to put him in the Senate and did because the ballots all burned up before the Rangers got there. So that guy is sitting there on one side and a more solid citizen you couldn't imagine. And then this flim flam man on the other <laughs> side, I got an education out of the deal. So you learned how to deal with sort of the both ends of both the, ends of the, the pole. spectrum. Yeah. And uh, both of them were good journalists in their own way. Uh, so I, I, you know, I'm, I, I have no one to blame on, blame it on. I am self-educated. Uh, I was always a reader. Read five, six books a week and have ever since I was 10 years old. Uh, 
and still do. Well, that had to really help you as a journalist. Absolutely. You, you, you cannot understand what good writing is until you understand by reading. I used to hire people for UPI in Los Angeles, and I, I would say they'd come in with all their clippings, and I would tell them, look, somebody else could have written that and put your name on it, as far as I'm concerned. I, I don't want to see your clippings. I want to see your library card. And if you don't have one, get out of my office. Uh, that tells me more than anything. What was your first experience of covering a situation outside the country, whether it was a war or another another issue or well, my first assignment outside the United States was uh, in 1964 after browbeating my bosses for a couple of years trying to get to Vietnam. They finally agreed to transfer me to Tokyo, Japan <clears throat> and put me to work on the Asia desk. Tokyo was Asia headquarters then for United Press International. And I went to work on the copy desk there as uh, Asia editor. And, uh, but as when I was leaving the States, I went to see my old mentor, Harry Truman, former president of the United States, and uh, told him I was going. And uh, he said, well, you're going to Tokyo, you're going to Japan, when you get there, I want you to go take a look at that Hiroshima place. You know, he says, I take a lot of crap for bombing them. Uh, I want you to go look at it and be my eyes and ears and, and let me know how they're doing. So in the early spring of 65, I went down, took a photographer and went down to Hiroshima and uh, called on the mayor and the governor and uh, did, did the whole town and, uh, and wrote a report to Harry Truman. Uh, I found, of course, it was a very prosperous town now and all of the damage had been repaired long since. Uh, what the, was his, oh, excuse me. Oh, go ahead. What was his response, or did he comment on what you reported? He, he didn't comment. He, he, uh, I didn't hear back from him. I, I sent him the, the report just so that he would know and wrote a story about it. Uh, but uh, he, uh, he just he wanted to know what, yeah. what the people thought about him. And, uh, the uh, mayor of Hiroshima was a socialist, and uh, he said, well, Mr. Galloway, he said, uh, we people of Hiroshima, we hold no grudge against uh, Mr. Truman, but uh, we do wish that he would quit saying if he had it all to do over again, he'd bomb us again. Mm -hmm. And I, I happen to know that the mayor, as a young man, had worked as a clerk in the post office in Hiroshima. And the night before it was nuked, his boss, he'd been working long hours, and his boss said, you know, Yoshi, you're, you look tired. Why don't you sleep in tomorrow morning? And he lived about 10 miles outside the city and uh, when the place got nuked, he was not there. He was home asleep, and it saved his life, of course. Wow. And uh, I said, Mr. Mayor, if Harry Truman had it all to do over again and the situation was the, exactly the same, you better sleep in again. <laughs> He was not amused. I was, I was going to ask you if he laughed. <laughs> he did not. The interview was over at that point. But Harry Truman's a, just a remarkable man. 
I, uh, I first came to know him when my first job outside Texas was Kansas City. And uh, the first day at work, the boss says, look, I'm going to break you in here on the day side a little bit, but then you're going on the night shift because you're the last guy hired. Uh, you get the crappy schedule. And uh, he said, inevitably, New York desk is going to ask you to get a comment from Harry Truman on this, that, or the other. And uh, he showed me the Rolodex and said, there's Mr. Truman's home phone. You call him. Hmm. And uh, it wasn't two weeks until exactly that happened. And I don't know what it was. It was some question. And uh, I, with trembling fingers, dialed the former president's home number at 9 o'clock at night. And he answered his own phone, you know, I was, and I was apologizing like crazy. And he said, no, son, he says, I like reporters, it's editors I hate. <laughs> he said, uh, go ahead and ask your question. And I asked it. And he said, yep, he said, uh, the answer to that is on page 197, volume two of my memoirs but I don't expect your editors can read. So I'll give you the answer again. And, uh, and I'm apologizing again. Yeah. He said, no, no, he said, I do like reporters. He said, come see me here at the library someday. Well, next time I had a day off, I hauled ass over to Independence, Missouri and visited with Mr. Truman and, and it became a habit. I would wow. go by and see him a couple of times a month. And uh, I would go in and I would stick my head in the door of Miss Rose, his secretary, and I'd say, Miss Rose, is the boss in? And she'd say, how many school buses did you see in the parking lot when you arrived? And I said, well, it must have been 20 or so. She said, then you know where he is. And I would go on down the hall to the auditorium and the former president would be sitting on the lip of the stage with his little feet dangling, talking to 500 eighth graders from Joplin, Missouri, about the Constitution of the United States of America and the responsibilities of the office of president. Never the power, but always he talked of the responsibilities. And I, I think back on that and I think on every president we have had since then and I can't see even one of them in that same position doing yeah. that same thing. Yeah. Harry Truman was truly one of a kind. He was a man of the people and he never, never thought of himself as anything but and he spent many, many a morning in that auditorium talking to a bunch of gawky kids. So his image as a regular guy is, is accurate, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. What an amazing experience for you. Oh, you have no idea. I was covering, Mr. Truman was doing a speech in, I believe, Dodge City, Kansas on the 24th day of October, 1962. And uh, because I was a friend of his, there'd be six or seven reporters in the hall of the hotel suite. He would send somebody out to bring me in. And I was sitting there in the hotel room with Harry and Bess Truman, John D. Montgomery, the Kansas Democratic chairman, and myself. When the phone rang and Mrs. Truman answered, and I can hear her voice, she, hello, <laughs> and uh, she says, Harry, it's the White House calling for you. <laughs> and Mr. Montgomery and I offered to get up and leave the room, uh, and Harry said, no, sit down. And uh, it was Jack Kennedy calling to declare the Cuban Missile Crisis. He was giving Truman a heads up that he would be on TV within the hour making this speech. And uh, we waited there with him and watched him critique Kennedy's speech. 
Can you now, tell us a little bit about what he you said? You know, that's pretty heady stuff for a kid who's 20 years yeah. old. That really is. Wow. Yeah. Was he positive about Kennedy's speech? Negative? A little bit of both? No, absolutely positive. Right. And, and hammer in the arm of his chair when, when Kennedy said that, that he was invoking not the Monroe Doctrine, but the Rio de Janeiro Treaty. And Harry's saying, George Marshall and I wrote that treaty for exactly this reason. Golly. And uh, point by point, uh, Truman was uh, making his points w along with Kennedy. Boy. You just, uh, you have no idea. I left there, I mean, we were trembling on the brink, brink of nuclear war. Yeah. And I had one of my uncles was, uh, uh, he flew as an uh, engineer on a uh, aerial refueling strategic air command ship, a tanker. And uh, he flew out of uh, Salina, Kansas. And I had to drive through there on my way back to Topeka from listening to Kennedy's speech. And he was gone, and so was every airplane there, and so was every airplane at Schilling Air Base in Topeka. And all of those, both of those were sacked bases. And later my uncle told me that every B-52 we had was either in the air or on the ground at Thule, Greenland, which is where he and the tankers were sitting. And they were cocked, locked and ready to rock. Wow. And we came so close. We came so close to nuclear war right then and there. I'm not sure that many people know how close we got based on the way I, I don't. It. I don't think they do. I don't think they do to this day. Gee. That, that's a fascinating experience. Yeah. <laughs> okay, it's 1964. And uh, let's start there with your first trip overseas. You were starting to talk about that, but I, the Harry Truman experience is just fascinating. Yeah. No, we, I, uh, I spent, as uh, soon as I got to Tokyo, I, I asked the boss there, I said, I want to go to Saigon. I want to go cover the Vietnam War. Oh, he said, you know, I just sent a second American to Saigon. We'll never need more than that. And I knew better, but I just thought, I'll, I'll hide and watch. And I, I worked on the Tokyo desk, uh, you know, uh, writing all of the China stories and all of the copy from Asia came through to be edited, rewritten, shortened, lengthened, sent to New York. Uh, and. That's what I did for a few months, but then things got hot. March of 65, the first Marines landed in Da Nang in South Vietnam, and the pressure was on. Uh, my boss was having to send people in temporary duty uh, so he could cover this, and uh, finally he just said, okay, you're going, get on the plane. And uh, early April of 65, I was on the plane to Vietnam, uh, got there, took a couple of days to get the accreditation cards and everything, and got on a, got on a C-123 milk run flight that went all the way, stopping at every town and every base in Vietnam, and got to Da Nang. And uh, I was in the war. I was in the war so quick I had not even gotten to the black market to buy fatigues and, <laughs> and boots. I, I was wearing chinos and loafers and uh, uh, I even have a picture of myself on my first combat operation. Uh, I, I got to Da Nang and uh, I, I had my clothing in a Samsonite suitcase my mother had given me for high school graduation. And uh, this, this very excited 
dark-skinned gentleman came running up and he said, you are Mr. Galloway? And I said, yeah. And he said, oh, I am Henri Huet, UPI photographer. You come with me. And I said, what about my suitcase? And he said a rude thing about my suitcase and put it, put it in the, the aerial squadron terminal and drug me onto a C-130 and, and I didn't know where we were going or what's happening. And we flew to uh, Quang Nai City. And uh, we got off, and if you've ever seen a, somebody stuck a stick in an anthill, it was like that. People were just going every which way, and there was a sense of panic in the air on this air, little airstrip. And uh, Henri ran over to a helicopter and talked to this guy, and then he waved at me, and I went over and got on this helicopter with him. And here we are, I don't know where we are, we're leaving for I don't know where to. And we flew out of there about 10 minutes on this Marine CH-34 helicopter, which is Korean War vintage, uh, shaking, I mean, give you a real massage. Uh, and we flew out of there about 10 minutes and we circled and I'm looking out the open door and there's a, a hill, not very high hill, in the middle of a, a rice paddy, a big rice paddy, like so. And uh, we landed on top of that hill, and the guy shut the chopper off, and, and there was dead silence. And we got out, and I looked around, and there were probably 200 little, they weren't foxholes, they didn't have time, they were just little indentations, and there was a man lying in each one like he was holding a rifle, except there was no rifle, and that man was dead. And they were all dead. They had been overrun, and all of them were killed by the Viet Cong. And what we were doing there was the crew chief of that helicopter needed help. We had to go man to man until we found the two American advisors and recovered their bodies and brought them back to the helicopter and brought them home. And that was our, our that's the only reason that guy let us on that helicopter was he needed help carrying the bodies. And, and I, I, it was a shock. It was a total shock. And I, you know, until that moment, my knowledge of war was limited to John Wayne movies, for God's sakes. Yeah. Uh, but now I saw the reality of it. I saw 200 dead Vietnamese, uh, and I saw two dead Americans, and I looked at their faces, and I carried their bodies and I looked at them all the way back to that base on that helicopter, and uh, they didn't look like John Wayne to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, in the movies, you're dead, you get up after they turn the camera off and you're okay, but not in a war. You're still dead. And uh, we got back to that, that town, that base, and it was getting near dark. And Henri told me, he said, look, they're so scared up here that all the Americans leave at night and fly back to Da Nang. But if we stay the night, we'll get a start early in the morning and we'll be ahead of the AP. I said, sounds good to me, Henri. <laughs> and we went over to spend the night at, at the MACV, was the advisor compound. We went over to that compound and there was a tall, skinny, totally exhausted army captain standing at the gate and he said, boy, am I glad you guys decided to stay here tonight. We have been on 24-7 alert for the last five days and I need some sleep and you guys are going to guard the base tonight. Okay. 
and I got a, I get, they had a switch, a little one lung army switchboard in there and the guy managed to connect me through to the bureau in Saigon and I'm dictating a story when they started mortaring the place. And I'm underneath the switchboard still dictating and, and the guy is at the other end, he says, what's that noise? And I said, they're shooting at us, you idiot. <laughs> Uh, it was my introduction to yeah. the Vietnam War. And uh, that night, Henri took the first shift for three hours, and then it was my turn. And uh, the guy gave us a, an M2 grease gun, 45 caliber submachine gun. And uh, my turn, I'm out there, I'm scared to death. I'm in this bunker with a slit that looks out right at the road. Well, during my shift, the enemy attacked the South Vietnamese compound, commander's compound across the, the little road. They hit it with satchel charges, blowing it up. And I'm figuring we're next. And finally, after the longest night of my life, there's a little light in the east, you know. The sun is going to come up in a minute, and I've made it. And I look, and down that road comes a Vietnamese guy on a bicycle with a big package on the front, on his handlebars. And I have jacked around in that machine gun, and I have got it right on him, and I'm about to blow his gizzard out. When the captain hits me on the shoulder and says, son, if you shoot that man, you're going to have to cook our breakfast. <laughs> oh. He was the cook. <laughs> and our breakfast was on his handlebars. <laughs> wow. I tell you, you, you know, you can't make stuff like no. that up. <laughs> well, you learned a lot in about 24 hours, didn't you? It didn't take long. You know, it didn't take long. My, my next introduction was uh, one of the Americans who had been in Saigon for a good while by then, uh, uh, Ray Herndon. He was a, also a Texan. Uh, came up to Da Nang to introduce me around, and, and he took me out to see the Vietnamese Arvin Corps commander, who was a, a four-star general. Uh, Wen Chan T by name, T-H-I, and uh, later he would uh, side with the Buddhists in an uprising and be exiled from the country. But at that time he was uh, truly the warlord of the northern part of South Vietnam and Herndon took me in to introduce me to him and, and he was a very blunt spoken guy and he looked at me and he said, are you Americans here to stay? You know, you've come in here and you are pushing us aside and you're saying we're taking this war over. He said, you know, we've been fighting this war for 20 odd years, a long time and now you say you're going to take it over. Are you going to stick? Are you going to stay the course? Because if you decide next year or 10 years from now that you're going to cut and run, when you leave, there are going to be people shooting holes in your helicopters and it's going to be me and my troops. And I just, I looked at him, I said, General, that's, that's way above my pay grade. I don't know who you think you're talking to. I'm just a kid reporter. You need to be talking to somebody else. That but said he, a lot when he said that, though. He, it? it meant a lot. It, he said a lot. And uh, I thought about him. He was exiled. Uh, the CIA saved him, I think, uh, uh, when Kao Ki wanted to shoot him. But a, a mutual friend of ours, a guy named General Sam V. Wilson, talked Key into not shooting T and 
letting him and his family come to the States. And uh, he lived in Northern Virginia until fairly recently when he died. But, uh, you know, I began then to understand something of just how complex the history and society of that place and those people was. And we had no business being there. We were getting ourselves in the middle of a civil war with a people we didn't understand that we were, if anything, contemptuous of. Your average American GI uh, just looked at them as gooks uh, and didn't understand who they were, what they were, what their history was. And I don't think you should go to war against anybody without really knowing those things. You, you know, you, you, why are you willing to take it upon yourselves to change a people and a country by violence mm -hmm. if you don't know what they are, who they are, you don't know their language? This is foolishness. Yeah. So I, I pretty early on decided that there was just no way we could win this thing. No matter how much force we brought against them, uh, just look at that Ho Chi Minh Trail. I, I went into the museums in Hanoi and they would tie sticks of bamboo to a plain old heavy iron bicycle and then load 400 pounds of stuff on it. And you got two guys, one of them's pushing and guiding from the front and the other one's pushing from the back. And they would come through 800 miles of jungle and deliver 400 pounds and turn around with the bicycle and go get another load. And we're sending $5 million warplanes piloted by $500,000 pilots to attack two guys barefooted in pajamas with a bicycle. I don't, I don't, I don't see how that computes. Yeah. And I certainly don't see how it computes to victory in war. Yeah. Uh, that wasn't going to happen. Wow. Never even got close. Never even one year of that war did we kill more of the enemy than they were their natural birth rate increase in Hanoi, in North Vietnam. Hmm. And so every year they were making a new crop of draftees for 18 years down the road. And we could sit there and do everything we could and only kill less than that number yeah. of increase. So you came to that realization pretty early. Then. Early. Yeah. And yet, first of all, I worked for United Press. They didn't pay us to have an opinion. They didn't pay us to write what our opinion was. In fact, they er actively discouraged you having an opinion. Did you have experiences where you wrote something and they censored it and wouldn't publish it because no, they disagreed? No, never. Never did because, I, you know, I knew what you wrote and what you shouldn't. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other thing was that I spent my time in the field. I spent my time with soldiers. And I was not going to be the one to tell them yeah. that the deaths of their comrades mm -hmm. were useless. Mm -hmm. I couldn't do that. Yeah. I could never bear it, not because I'd be afraid, but because I would be ashamed to hurt them mm -hmm. that badly. Yeah. So I knew but I didn't say. Yeah. Well, that's good. 
when it's over, we can talk about yeah. it. But not when you're grieving the loss of so many of your friends. And I was losing friends too. There were 70 journalists who were killed in action just trying to get the story mm -hmm. or the picture, just trying to tell the truth. You know, when I turned 30 years old, I did an accounting. And I had more friends who were dead than were alive. That's what happens when you go to war when you're 23, yeah. 24. Can I ask a question? Sure, Can I ask? sure. Joe, you <coughs> had a, uh, there was a question that the students asked you earlier. We had that wonderful meeting with the students and they asked you about your relationship with the troops. Yeah. That you served aside. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Oh, absolutely. You know, you would turn up to go march with an infantry company, Marines or Army, didn't matter. Uh, and you might stay three hours or three days or even a week. Uh, but it always w went kind of the same, you know. You would march. We wore fatigues like theirs and jungle boots and, and uh, uh, sometimes carried a weapon, sometimes not. Uh, but you'd be marching along for a while and then they stop for a smoke break or check the map or eat some sea rations and you sit down in the dirt and the guy next to you says, uh, who are you? Oh, well, I'm a reporter. And he'd think about that and he'd say, are you a civilian? Yeah. And you're out here with me? Yeah. Damn, they must pay you a lot of money. No, I work for United Press, the cheapest outfit in the world. <laughs> oh, you'd say, and you're crazy as hell. But nobody understands crazy like the infantry. And he'd, he'd just grin, and the guy next to him would say, who the hell is that? And he'd say, oh, it's some crazy reporter. <laughs> that, but... If you stayed the night, the next day his answer would be, it's our crazy reporter. Mm -hmm. You stayed with them, then, uh, I, and, I, and it never changed from war to war. There's a kid who lives over on the coast of North Carolina now that I ran into with the 7th Cavalry in the Persian Gulf War in the middle of nowhere Saudi Arabia. And, uh, and he stuck in my mind because he had a clown about that big tattooed on his butt cheek. <laughs> and the first time I met him, he showed it to me. <laughs> and, uh, and he now is a high school history teacher in <laughs> North Carolina, and I know where he is, and we keep track of each other. It just... The, the, the relationship between a correspondent and the soldier is just the same as between one soldier and another, or it, it seems to me, because I felt as much a soldier as I did a reporter. And I'm sure that's because you stayed with them. You didn't fly in in the morning and fly out at night. You, you lived their life. I lived their life. I, I, I rolled up many a night in a poncho and it's awful uncomfortable and there are bugs and snakes. And I can remember nights when the mosquitoes were so bad that I took the plastic bag that I kept my camera and lenses in and put it over my head because they were driving me crazy. It's kind of hard to breathe in a plastic bag, but it's better than being eaten alive by mosquitoes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the first time that I took those orange anti-malarial pills, I went blind for 12 hours. I couldn't see past the end of my nose. And so I couldn't take those pills. And I, I thought if it's a choice between going blind and getting malaria, yeah. I'll take malaria. Yeah. So I, I, you know, one thing about 
I spent 12 years in Southeast Asia and I had everything you can have. I had dengue fever, I had malaria, I had every parasite known to man, including a world record 23 foot long tapeworm. Uh, you know, I, I loved Southeast Asia and I thought to myself, I would love to live here all my life, but I don't think my life will be very long if I do stay here. Yeah. So I better get out. <laughs> <laughs> well, as I mentioned in the introduction, uh, you're the only person that's been awarded a combat medal by the Army. And would you talk about that battle, what surrounded it, how you got into it, and what happened? Well, it's a long story, and well, it, it really it, starts in mid-October of 1965 with the laying of a North Vietnamese Army siege against a little special forces camp called Play Me up in the mountain yard country in the Central Highlands. And uh, in that camp were a dozen Americans on an A-team, special forces A-team, and uh, maybe a hundred or a hundred and twenty-five uh, CIDG, they called them, irregular defense force. Mountain yards, uh, people that were hired on as mercenaries mm -hmm. by the special forces. And uh, that, that place fell under siege and uh, they shot down two or three helicopters and a couple of our Air Force fighter planes, shot down a B-57 Canberra for God's sakes. Mm. And uh, they closed the airspace. Well, the Special Forces sent a reinforcing team in led by a guy named Major Charlie Beckwith a uh, fellow out of Georgia, out of the University of Georgia, a football player, a special forces guy. Later would go on to found the Delta. Uh, and uh, Beckwith and uh, his little team from a, a B-57 detachment, they called it, they were specialists in going across the border into Laos and Cambodia. And they were sent in to stiffen the resistance in this camp. And I missed them going in just by a matter of hours. And so I was mad as a wet hen. I was stomping up and down the flight line and to play coup. And I ran into an old Texas Aggie buddy of mine, uh, Captain Burns. And uh, he said, what's the matter, Joe? And I said, well, I want to get in to play me special forces camp. And they, I can't find a ride. And he said, well, let me go check. And he went down to the flight office and he came back and he says, well, dummy, airspace is closed over there. I said, I know that, but I still want to go. He said, well, he said, I wouldn't mind taking a look myself. You, come on, we'll go. That's how you work things mm -hmm. back then. And he flew me in, and I shot a picture out of the open door of that Huey. It's kind of laying on its side, and we're at about 150 feet and kind of spiraling in. and is perfect. You got the triangular camp right in the frame of this picture, in the frame of that open doorway, and you can see the mortar shells exploding all over it, and that's where we're going. And we, he pulled in there, and I jumped out, and they threw a few wounded people on board, and my buddy is gone shooting me the bird through the plexiglass <laughs> as he heads up the mountain with my ride. And a Special Forces Master Sergeant comes up and he said, Sir, he said, I don't know who you are, but Major Beckwith wants to see you right now. And I said, well, which one is he? 
He said, it's that big fellow over there jumping up and down on his hat. And, and that's what he was doing, jumping up and down on his hat. I went over there somewhat timidly, and, uh, and he said, who the hell are you? And I said, I, I'm a reporter. And he, he scratched his head, and he said, you know, he said, I need everything in the world. I need ammo. I need medevac. I need food. I would love to have a bottle of Jim Beam whiskey and a box of cigars, and what has the Army in its wisdom sent me but a goddamn reporter? He said, son, I have news for you. I do not have a vacancy for a reporter, but I desperately need a corner machine gunner, and you're it. And he proceeded to drag me over to a uh, bunker not even a bunker, really a slit trench with some sandbags piled up and, uh, and a air-cooled 30 caliber machine gun. And he showed me how to load it and how to clear a jam. And he gave me my instructions. He said, you can shoot the little brown men outside the wire. The ones on the inside belong to me. He said, and one more thing, I want you always to have your left eye on that bunker down there. That's our supposed allies. I don't trust them as far as I can throw them. If they turn that machine gun around, take them out. And I ran that machine gun for two days and nights. Wow. And uh, finally we got relief a column broke through. They had planned the ambush to uh, lure the relief armor column of Vietnamese out of Play Coup. That was the last Vietnamese left in Play Coup. And if they could ambush them and kill them all, then crush the camp, finish us off in a hurry. But we were the bait. Uh, then they could take Play Coup and go on and cut the country in half right down Route 19. And uh, the, uh, the, uh, the fact that the cavalry was there and was able to jump artillery along with that Arvin column and, and broke through the ambush. They had a whole regiment of North Vietnamese sitting there to take them out. And they, they, between air support and that immediate artillery, they couldn't do it. Yeah. And uh, that set the stage for the Iodrang campaign. Okay. When the ca cavalry battalion landed on those hills right outside Play Me Camp, I was going out to hook up with them. And I went to say my goodbyes to uh, Major Beckwith. And he said, you, you done good on that machine gun, boy. He said, uh, you want to come with me on some of my other missions? And I said, how long do they last? And he said, oh, sometimes 10 days, two weeks, three weeks. I said, Major, they're probably going to fire me for being three days in this camp with no contact with the home office. I said, I better say no. He said, you're not carrying a piece, son. I said, well, technically speaking, in spite of the use you've made of me these last two days and nights, I'm a civilian non-combatant. And he said, Ain't no such thing in these mountains, boy. He said, Sergeant, get this boy an M16 and a bag of magazines. He's going to need them if he's going to stay up here. Wow. And they brought me an M16 and a bag of 20 loaded magazines, and I threw them over my shoulder and marched off with the cab to clear those mountains around the camp. We found the the wreckage and remains of 10 50 caliber air anti-aircraft Chinese machine guns that had their gunners legs chained to the tripod so that they wouldn't run when they came under the uh, intense air attack. 
there was there was a regiment's worth of machine guns up there, Jeez. and uh, we got them. We got them all. Wow! But that was it was some hairy times, and that was the prelude okay. to the Iodrang campaign. Uh, I went back to play coup, file that story, and ship my film. And uh, then I came out to a place called the Kateka Tea Plantation, uh, which was where the cavalry brigade had just set up to uh, run their operation, Hal Moore's battalion and one other battalion, 1st and 2nd of the 7th Cavalry, and then later they added a 5th Cavalry Battalion to it. And uh, they had a big Viet Cong attack on the brigade headquarters one night. I was in town that night and came back out the next day. And uh, boy, they had, uh, had a close run thing. They had, uh, they had art we had artillery and they were charging across a, an open air, airfield, dirt runway, and here came the North Vietnamese and the Viet, mostly Viet Cong out of the rubber plantation. They cranked those, those howitzers down and they had plenty of beehive rounds and they ate them alive because they had practiced attacking a certain way and they hadn't counted on those artillery pieces. And, and once they've rehearsed it, they just keep doing it and they, until it works or until they're all dead. Yeah. And in that case, they were all dead. Yeah. They just charged into those howitzer barrels and you can't do that. Yeah. It's a deadly operation. Anyway, that, that set my feet on the way to landing zone x-ray on the uh, 14th day of November, one day after my 24th birthday. I spent that night under a tube bush in a foxhole. I dug myself with uh, a company of infantry that were guarding the regiment, uh, the brigade headquarters. And the next morning, Hal Moore's battalion air, air assaulted into this clearing at the foot of the Chupong Massif, which ran 12, 14 miles back into Cambodia. So it was a natural highway for infiltration. It was full of lime, it was limestone, and it was full of caves that were easily dug, and the enemy was in there. They had supplies in there. This was a, a regimental headquarters area, and Hal Moore lands his battalion right smack in the middle of them. And on the uh, 10, 10 a.m. on the 14th uh, Sunday, I'll never forget it, November. 1965. 1965. And uh, I was on one of the lift helicopters, taking the company out of Kateka to go to X-ray, and I, I had slipped onto the helicopter, and along came an officer, and he had a medic with him, and he kept looking in helicopter after helicopter, and he came to the one I was on, and he looked in at me and said, who the hell are you? And I said, I'm a reporter. And he said, I need that seat for a medic. Get the hell off that helicopter. So I got thrown off and didn't regret it a bit. They needed a medic more than a, than a reporter. And uh, the brigade commander uh, said, don't worry about it. It's probably going to be a, hot, a long, hot walk in the sun. And if anything happens, I'm going out there. So you just hang right here. Well, they no more than landed than all hell broke loose. And the radios went wild. And uh, the colonel comes storming out of his tent 
and I just fell right into his slipstream and went right to his command helicopter and got aboard. And we flew out there, and it wasn't hard to find. There was uh, smoke was rising in the air 5,000 feet, and it was straight to it. We were circling overhead. Uh, the colonel wanted to land, and Hal Moore very much did not want him landing there. He was telling him on the radio, Colonel, you land that command ship with all those antenna down here, and you're going to be a bullet magnet. And I guarantee you, you're going to have to walk home because your bird won't fly when they finish shooting it up. I got two birds already on the ground here. And uh, the colonel was arguing a bit, but losing the argument, we were circling. When they shot down a uh, A1E Sky Raider, right, went, went in right below us, uh, streaming a, a hundred feet of fire from his belly. And they were, I had the cans on my ears and, and they were yelling, anybody see a shoot, anybody see a shoot. And I watched him, my side of the helicopter. I watched that bird go right in the jungle. And uh, I clicked the mic and I said, no shoot, no shoot. He rode it in and uh, he's still there. He's still there, Air Force captain. Had a wife and five kids. Some years ago, they went to his wife and said, uh, we've, we've located the wreckage and we can do a recovery of remains. And uh, the wife said, look, the Air Force has taken care of putting all five of my kids through college. Uh, he was very proud of what of his service and what he was doing, and he rests in a place of a historic battle. Leave him in peace. That was her choice, and he rests there today. Wow! And I can see that plane going in just just as clear as day. Uh, and the colonel wasn't going to land, so he dropped me at the fire base about five clicks away where the howitzers were providing fire yeah. support. But I still wasn't there. It took several hours more, and uh, I recognized Hal Moore's Three, his operations officer, Matt Dillon, captain, went hurrying by and I grabbed him. I said, Matt, I need a ride in there. He said, well, I'm going in as soon as it's dark with a load of ammo uh, and water, but I can't take you without the old man says so. I said, get him on the radio. And uh, I followed him into the tent, and he got on the, the Prick 25, and, and there's Hal Moore on the other end. He's telling him what he's bringing and when he's coming. And he said, by the way, he said, that reporter Galloway, he wants to, he's here, and he wants to come in with me. And I'm listening close, and Hal Moore says, if he's crazy enough to want to come in here and you got room, bring him. I had my ticket to ride. All I had to do then, there were by now, there's Peter Arnett of the AP and four or five other reporters are in that fire base and they've been wanting to ride too. And uh, all I had to do then was hide from them until it got near dark and they caught a ride back to play coup where they could get a cold bunk and a hot meal. <laughs> And I got a ride into the pages of history. As soon as it was dark, I got on a helicopter piloted by Colonel Bruce Crandall, then Major Crandall, and uh, we flew into landing zone X-ray just at dark, just before moonrise, and uh, there I was truly a 
the worst, bloodiest battle of the entire 10 years of the Vietnam War. 242 Americans killed in four days. 300 wounded badly in four days. Uh, all told, 305 Americans killed in the operation. You know, there's been a lot written about this, but this is an opportunity for people to hear about it firsthand from somebody that was there. Um, please talk about that to whatever extent you want to and what you think people ought to know about that battle. Well, most of what you need to know about the battle you could find in the book mm -hmm. and in the movie. The movie is maybe 75% reality based on the book, 25% Hollywood BS, okay. which is the reverse of normal for those guys anyway. Yeah. But uh, the, the, the very meaty details of that battle are in page after page, yeah. 440 yeah. pages of our book. And it's very detailed, too. We put our hearts and souls and everything we could find about that battle, about the men on both sides, mm -hmm. the commanders on both sides, two trips to Hanoi, to interview the enemy commanders. What was that like? That was, first of all, we hadn't done that. We fought two wars since World War II. The last time we were able to do that was with World War II and only because the German generals were in our prison camps and they had to answer our questions. Uh, this was, uh, I was, we, the first trip we virtually forced the door open. I forced the door open. They were not willing participants. And they had said that they would give us a visa. And the general and I got to Bangkok with the, and picked up our photographer and then the embassy kept saying, we have no authority from Hanoi to give you a visa. And I was getting furious because U.S. News was picking up the bill for three of us in a hotel in Bangkok and it was getting very expensive and there was going to be no product at the end. I didn't like that. So the guy, the guy at the embassy, the Vietnamese embassy said, why don't you go see this Australian businessman here in Bangkok? He has very good ties to Hanoi, to very high up people in Hanoi, and maybe he can explain it. And so the general and I on, on a morning went out to this guy's house. He lived like a pasha. Uh, and he said, look, here's the deal. You're a reporter. They understand you. You can get a visa anytime. It's this general here they don't understand, and they don't want to give him a visa because they don't understand the purpose that he wants to come to Hanoi. And I said, okay, the purpose both of us come to Hanoi is to ask your commanders to tell us their side of this battle. It's what military historians do or would love to do if they could. And uh, he said, well, they don't understand that in Hanoi. I said, okay, I know what they do understand in Hanoi. So you send them a message right now and you tell them, I'm the deputy foreign editor of U.S. News and World Report magazine. Twelve million people in the United States read that every week. And I'm going to write every story personally on Vietnam and Southeast Asia for the next 25 years. And I'm going to stick it in this deep and break it off. And he said, my God. God, Mr. Galloway, surely you don't want me to tell them that. 
I said, I want you to tell them precisely that. If I don't get that visa, they are toast. You know, I got a call at 7 a.m. the next morning from the guy at the embassy saying, Mr. Galloway, would you and General Moore come down and get your visas? <laughs> and we were on our way to Hanoi. But they, they wouldn't give us who we wanted. They, they gave us Jop, who was wonderful to have. They gave us the chief of military history who had been on the battlefield which was wonderful, but they wouldn't give us the, the actual North Vietnamese Army commanders. But with the two that I got, I could make a cover story on the 25th anniversary of the battle. Yeah. And it's interesting because that story convinced Hanoi that we were exactly what we said we were, and our purpose in being there was precisely to accurately quote what they said and to tell the story of this battle. And they decided that was as much in their interest as it was in the other sides. And so that article got us the contract to write the book. And we were in the middle of writing that book when a cable arrived from Hanoi and said, if you and General Moore will come back to Hanoi, we will give you the North Vietnamese commanders who fought against you. And so we debated a little bit and said, we got to do it. There's no not doing it. We got on a plane and went to Hanoi and uh, they put us in that same little ratty guest room hotel in the center of the defense ministry compound in Hanoi. It's like being put in a residence in the center of the Pentagon. We were in the very belly of the beast. And we would go in and sit down with General Ahn. I think I taped seven hours of interview with him six hours with General Mon, Chu Hui Mon, the division commander. And these are guys who uh, went on to, General Mon became the commissar of the People's Army of Vietnam and a member of the Politburo. Uh, General An rose to three stars and was the commander of their equivalent of the War, Army War College. Uh, when the Chinese attacked and seized that mountain inside South, inside North Vietnam in 1970, I want to say right three, around, yeah. four, something like right that. Around that right around that. Right around then, maybe at 76, I don't know. But they came in, they invaded Vietnam, they seized this mountain, and the Vietnamese had done a couple of counterattacks that got beaten back. They grabbed General An out of his college duties, his war college duties, and his staff and sent him up to the border and said, you better take that mountain back. And he told us about doing that. They, they did. Uh, so we were given exactly what we had asked for. And uh, that we, we came back, it was by now, it was October, and we were supposed to hand the manuscript in by Christmas. So here I am, I've got half a book to write, and I've got all this new material to feed in. So we were burning the midnight oil seven days a week. Finally, we had it done. We got on the train to New York from Washington. The general was staying at his son's house at night, but I was keeping him up till midnight. He, he described it later. He said, now I know what it feels like to be 
uh, work on a plantation in the old days, and you're the slave driver. I, he said I changed his, I chained his leg to my dining room table. <laughs> but well, it paid off. That it did. That it did. We took that box with the manuscript in it up to New York and walked into their senior vice president and chief editor and plopped that on his desk. And Hal Moore looked at him and said, we have brought you the heart of the buffalo. And this book editor was horrified. He thought blood was going to be leaking out of that box. <laughs> Uh, well, you can see why that's been named one of the ten greatest books about war with that kind of research and being uh, able to do what you did that hasn't been done really. With, we moved you said. the goalpost. Yeah. One of my general friends, we, we printed up probably 300 copies of the manuscript and I very carefully placed it with people that knew what they were going to be reading mm. and, and would be able to start the buzz, oh. and uh, it was, you know, the reaction was overwhelming. Yeah. I knew we had it. Yeah. I told General Moore, you, you know, this is going to change your life. Mm -hmm. He said, well, how do you mean? <laughs> I said, you're about to become very famous. Mm -hmm. Boy, he said, I don't know if I'm ready for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, talk about what you did subsequent to that throughout the rest of your career and just any experiences you would like well, to share. Well, I stayed in Vietnam mm -hmm. from that November of 65 until September of 66. And uh, while I was leaving Vietnam, I wasn't leaving Asia. I liked that place. So I went back to Tokyo and did two years there. And then I transferred to be the bureau chief in Jakarta, Indonesia. And I stayed there six years. Hmm. Then I went from Jakarta to New Delhi to be the South Asia manager of UPI. I think I had eight countries. Everything from Afghanistan through Burma. A wonderful place. Uh, and uh, then I came back to Singapore for two years as the Southeast Asia manager. But in all of this time, I kept going to different wars. I went to, uh, in 71, I covered this uh, Marxist guerrilla uprising in Sri Lanka. Then I went from there to Dhaka in East Pakistan for the India-Pakistan War. I started off the war on the side of the Pakistan Army and ended up uh, being liberated by the Indian Army and watching the creation of a new nation, Bangladesh. Hmm. I, get, I get interview requests from Bangladesh. I think they think I'm a George Washington figure. <laughs> <laughs> they keep wanting me to come over for their festivities and I, you know, Bangladesh is not high on my list of <laughs> tourist attractions, but I did that. I covered uh, the the uh, Indonesian takeover of Portuguese Timor, stuff like that. New Guinea, the uprisings in Papua New Guinea, stuff like that, uh, was almost a constant in my life. I I. I kept things packed so that I could grab and run, yeah. head for the airport. Uh, you had to keep research material handy on a country, on any of these countries, and I, I had that. I would grab it. I could read it on the plane going in and hit the ground and start filing stories. That's, that's what you got to do when you're a wire service fireman. Yeah. You're always putting out fires. Well, and that had to be exciting. It was. It was. And I get to where it's time to think about leaving Southeast Asia. 
and uh, they call up and say, well, we want to make you the bureau chief in Moscow in the Soviet Union. Now, at that point, I hadn't seen a winter in 12 years, <laughs> and they're going to send me in the middle of winter to the Soviet Union. Uh, and that's what they did, and that's where you go. You know, you get the army mentality. They, yeah. They're going to move yeah. you every three mm -hmm. years somewhere, and you have no choice. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so I went, and uh, it was fascinating. Uh, I'm glad it was at the end of a long foreign career because I understood what I was seeing. And I could go in there and tell them, look, I've seen much better run dictatorships than you got going here. And they would probably listen to you a little. Well, whether they reacted. They or had not. no choice but to listen <laughs> to me. What I understood going in was that anything they did to me as the UPI bureau chief in Moscow, we were going to do to the task bureau chief in Washington, D.C. And while I was not a professional spy, he was mm. a colonel in the KGB. Oh. And the Russians never make stupid trades. Mm. And I knew that, and they knew I knew that. Yeah. And I hammered them every day. Yeah. <laughs> and they could stand there like a jackass in a hailstorm <laughs> and take it. <laughs> I had fun. You got to have some light amusement in yeah. a place yeah. like Moscow, yeah. and there's not much to be had. <laughs> that was a culture shock, I guess, after the places you had been. Previously. Well, it was. You know, it's 52 shades of gray, <laughs> and uh, I've, I gather that it's much improved in some ways and much worse in others, mm -hmm. but. Uh, it looks to me like it's still run by the KGB. Yeah, yeah. Whatever they call that form of government they've got. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a mess, and it was a mess then. It's easy to believe that all of the intelligent people ran away in 1917, and that all you got left are a nation of potato farmers. Hmm. Wow. Uh, what did you do subsequent to that that you'd like to share with us as far as your experiences? Or well, they, they offered me the Paris Bureau, but I was tired of overseas, and yeah. so they sent me to Los Angeles, which worked perfectly. It was just like another foreign country. <laughs> Had a hard time finding the visa office, but other than that, uh, I had a couple of years for UPI in Los Angeles, and then I switched over to be the West Coast editor of U.S. Okay. News. And uh, that was different, very different. First of all, they paid me real money. <laughs> UPI never did. <laughs> and I never cared because I was living overseas and living off my expense account and yeah. whatever pitiful salary they paid me I could put in the bank yeah. and uh, and I worked in Los Angeles for two years for them and when my savings were gone I had to find a real job after only 22 years with United Press oh. International. And I left uh, and went to U.S. News, did two years, and then was called back to their headquarters in Washington, D.C., and did a senior editor job for a while, and then a senior writer job, which was much more fun. And I got to do all kinds of things. Very great pleasure, and uh, I left that and uh, did a one-year tour as a special consultant to General Colin Powell at the State Department. I was sworn into government service on the 10th day of September 2001. And I was standing in line at the badge office at State when they flew the planes into the Pentagon and the World Trade Center. And uh, the world turned upside down. Yeah. 
I spent that next year writing speeches and articles for Secretary Powell. He's one of the finest men I've ever worked for. Then I went to work for Knight Ritter newspapers in D.C. as their senior military correspondent. Uh, and they gave me a weekly syndicated column so I could finally begin taking revenge. <laughs> <laughs> or at least trying to balance yeah. the yeah. scales. Yeah. And when did you get out? Well, you're still in journalism. Technically, I guess, sort of, but, you, but uh, I tell you what, I decided to hang it up in 2006, February to be precise. I was on my last combat patrol in a place called Mosul, Iraq, with the 256th Striker Brigade of the U.S. Army, and uh, I was in a platoon of three striker vehicles and we had been on patrol for about three hours and I'm in the back hatch with a, a sergeant and we're talking on the intercom when the radio just went crazy. We had a pair of Kiowa warrior helicopters flying over, cap, flying protection over us as we patrolled the city and one of them had just been shot down. And uh, his wingman gave the, the strikers the uh, exact coordinates of where the plane went down, where the bird, the helicopter went down. And we were there in two minutes. Uh, and it had crashed in a, somebody had dug a half block foundation excavation for a bu building that never got built. And any hole in the ground in Iraq becomes a garbage dump. And they've been throwing garbage <coughs> in it for years. And uh, it was rainy season, it was cold, it was raining. And uh, we skidded down the muddy sides of that pit and started looking for the wreckage of the helicopter. Well, it was, it was all wreckage, the whole junk heap. And finally, we spotted a tendril of smoke, and we found the wreckage of the chopper, and there were two men in it. We pulled it apart with our bare hands and got the pilot out. He was dead, just. And we tore into the other side of the helicopter and got the co-pilot out, and uh, he was alive. We had a pulse. And we got him up the side of that muddy pit and into the back of a, of a striker to get him to a helicopter landing pad. And he died before he got there. Huh. And I tell you, I was standing there in that rain and thankful it was raining because you couldn't tell I was crying because I knew what was going to happen with those two families, a wife in each one, two babies in each one, all under the age of four. And an army sedan is going to pull up and their lives are going to be destroyed. And to me, it was exactly the same as looking in the faces of those two men I pulled off that mountaintop in Vietnam so many years before. And I couldn't take it anymore. I'm 65 years old and I'm still running up and down sand dunes after 19-year-old Marines and looking in the faces of dead Americans. That ain't right. So I quit. I quit. I hung it up the 1st of June, 20. Lord, I can't even remember now, 2006. And on the 1st of June, I loaded the last of my stuff in a U-Haul truck, as big a one as I could rent, and I headed south to Texas at a high lope. 
Well, you sure earned your right to retire. Yeah, well, they wouldn't let me. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, what's the rest of the story? <laughs> well, they keep me busy. I, I kept writing the column for another four or five years. Yeah. And uh, then I married Doc Gracie, and she wouldn't move to Texas, so I had to move to North Carolina. And then they hired me to work for the Vietnam War 50th Commemoration Project. And uh, so I've been doing that for three years. They keep me on the road going around the country doing interviews with Vietnam veterans and doing speeches. And uh, I guess it keeps me limber and out of the bars. <laughs> Well, it also serves a great mission of being with those veterans, letting them tell their stories. Yeah. I yeah. learn something new mm -hmm. from every interview. Yeah. I really do. There, there's stories that chill your blood. Mm -hmm. There are stories that make your heart glad. Yeah. It's all different, but you learn something from every one of them. And they probably learn something from you every time. Oh, Lord, I, I don't know. I ain't supposed to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Sue, do you or Tony have any questions? No. Just one last one, and I know we've kept you way too long, but you saw soldiers in Vietnam, and you've seen soldiers in the post-9-11 conflicts. Do you see differences? Are they the same? The differences are external. The differences are in training and equipment and weaponry. You know, there's not a lot of doubt that the modern equipment is better than the old stuff. Uh, but that's not what makes a soldier. Soldiers' hearts are what you f look for and feel, and those are unchanged. They're unchanged through 6,000 years of recorded history. Soldiers do what they do out of a selflessness and a willingness to give uh, without hope of reward. They do it for their family, they do it for their country, but most of all, what I found is they do it for each other. The man on the left, the man on the right. And uh, that's unchanged and unchanging. They're going to always be willing to step up and do it. Well, that's... I can't imagine that being said better. Is there All anything right. else you would like to say? No, I think I've covered just about the whole waterfront. <laughs> well, I want to thank you, number one, for sitting down with us and telling your story. And I want to thank you for what you've done for the country and for veterans. And by your writing all the way back to when you first had that little little typewriter <laughs> up through now. I mean, you have served a purpose of telling the veteran stories that is invaluable. And a lot of people know about what went on because of you and the way you tell the story and the way you spoke to these high school students today. I mean, you, nobody wants to be called a hero, but I think what you're doing is heroic and that you're educating society about our country and about history and about veterans and I just personally want to thank you for being here and thank you for your service. Well thank you. I, I'm no hero. I had the great honor of standing alongside some real heroes and I know what they are yeah. and who they are and they're my friends and my brothers and sisters and uh, I'm the luckiest guy you ever seen because about a million bullets were fired in my direction and not one of them took effect. Yeah. And I think it was Winston Churchill who said there's nothing so exhilarating as to be fired upon without effect. <laughs>
I can't. Right. Th I can't think of a better way to to end the, end the discussion. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you Thank very you, much. Joe. Thank you.